we were all here to record the first episode of Are You Gay? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse oh, that's me, perfect. ma'am? That's perfect. Ma'am? Yeah. No, that's cool. Welcome to the Matthew Peterson Show. Today we have a special treat, something a little different. The first in a series we're calling Conversations. Between you and me and the NSA, who's always listening, we're just making it up as we go. Uh, but that's because uh, we don't have interviews on the show, do we, Vince? Except for uh, when um, we happen to be in the same room with uh, friends Michael Anton, Daryl Cooper of Martyr Maid, um, and uh, Charles Haywood, Worthy House, Dave Raboy. Um, and we're all around together at a secret event. And I decided, hey, after a few adult beverages, it sounds like a good idea if we all just get in the same room and talk about Caesarism. Uh, I don't know uh, how it turned out. I almost don't want to look. But uh, I think it will be interesting to everybody. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. We could do a lot more of this in the future. And uh, special thanks to uh, someone who will remain anonymous who was, uh, was uh, gracious enough to help us with iPhones in the off-the-cuff manner in which we pulled this together uh, to, to shoot it, um, you know. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that. The topic is Caesarism. Uh, I will say that everyone in this show is uh, speaking for themselves. Um, you know, if you have a problem with what they say, take it up with them. Everyone's a big boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I would just enjoy it. Uh, I think everyone was talking about Caesarism and not so much about whether they supported it or not, or how far uh, they think it is till the day when it happens. Uh, some of them have been vocal online. I encourage you to check the show notes and check out everything these guys do and say. Um, they're all people I've known for a while and I think are great, uh, at least very interesting, whether you agree or disagree. I would say for myself, the one thing that uh, you'll hear more about from me on this topic is uh, I think that before we get to Caesarism, if you want to fend off someone who, one man, who's going to arrest the decline of our declining republic, before you get there, we can stave it off by radical federalism. If you allow for freedom among the states and the red states stand up against the feds, you can give us some time before some really bad things start to happen. Uh, either it, the you know, country splits apart and people are calling for national divorce so we can go our own ways, or you get something like a one man coming in to cut the Gordian knot of the deep state, et cetera, uh, you know, so anyway, I, I think radical federalism is the, the prudent response before you get to that level. But as a matter of regime analysis, what we're about to say is, and what we're about to get into is uh, Caesarism itself. Now, I want to remind you that there is only one T in the country worthy of Caesar. Uh, anyone who is an aspiring Caesar uh, should know, if they do not already, that Gold River Trading Company, that's Gold River Co. GoldRiverCo.com. GoldRiverCo.com. This is a new founding company. This is one of ours. Uh, so if you are a Caesar or aspiring Caesar, or you just want to sit back and think quietly without all uh, the coffee caffeine, do what I've done, uh, which is slowly move towards some kind of semblance of health again. Uh, and Go to the the anti you know woke company that actually is uh, part of the new founding universe. Uh, I mean, Gold River is unabashedly pro freedom, pro America, Christian, anti cancel cancel culture. But it's not about you know this ridiculous like draping itself in the American flag and gun girls and all this kind of stuff. It is just an American tea uh, company that is incredible. And so if you go to Gold River uh, Co dot com. You will save 10% off of all orders using the discount code NEWFOUNDING, NEWFOUNDING at checkout. Save 10%, get the T, support NEWFOUNDING, uh, and you're on your way to a better life, a better way of life with Gold River. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoy this ridiculous show you're about to see. Peterson. I don't normally do interviews on my podcast, but when I do, I do it with Dave Raygun. What time is it, Ravoy? 
late in the evening. I do it with martyr maid, Daryl Cooper, here, present, and accounted for. I do it with Charles Haywood of The Worthy House, the worthy man himself. And I do it with Michael Anton, representing himself and his book, The Stakes, which you should have bought already. And if you didn't, nah, that's your problem. Why are we all here? Still for uh, sale. We're all here to record the first episode of Are You Gay? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. So we actually don't have a title for this show yet. We're going to see where it goes. But what we are going to talk about is Caesarism, given the personages that have assembled for a reason that you'll never find out about and never know about. Uh, but what matters is the fact that we're all here now. And so what I want to do first is ask Charles why Caesarism is good. Because, I mean, if you know anything about this topic... You know that, uh, and if you've been reading any of us online, you know that Charles has said things that are positive about, uh, and way more, I think, than anyone else publicly, that are positive about, uh, you know, Caesar's appearance and what will come of it. Caesarism is a Gordian knot solution. That is, our, everybody agrees, or everyone who's intelligent agrees, that our nation faces a wide range of problems. And while people offer solutions such as renewal, or return to the founding principles, which are fine in theory, in practice are impossible in the teeth of the, the face of the opposition and the teeth of the left. So therefore, it's possible that Caesarism offers a worthwhile solution. It's also possible that Caesarism, Caesarism offers a solution that will not work out. But nonetheless, Caesarism, which I would think of as an authoritarian reconstructor of a, of a society's polity, is something that would solve, at least potentially, the problems that we face today. Wait a minute. But isn't, isn't that bad? Like most people, most people listening, a lot of good people listening <clears throat> will say, I don't know what, you're, what you mean when you talk about Caesarism. If you mean Caesar, uh, that's anti-American. It's authoritarian. It's a, uh, it's someone who by definition is a tyrant. So why should I think that is a good thing? And that leads to the question of what are we talking about when we talk about Caesars? Well, I, uh, I like to think about it in terms of um, that Leo Strauss talked about it at the beginning of his, I think one of his greatest essays called The Restatement on Xenophon's Hiero, which is, to make a long story short, there's a little, uh, doc, uh, sorry, not documentary, a dialogue by Xenophon called uh, On Tyranny, in which a, a wise poet discusses with a tyrant the advantages and disadvantages of tyranny. So, so Strauss explicates the dialogue, explains what it says. A great 20th century philosopher, who also, I have to admit, turned out to have been a communist spy, but that's a story for another day, <laughs> writes a long response to Strauss's review of Strauss's book, and then Strauss responds to him in the famous restatement. In the first 11 or 12 pages of the restatement, Strauss responds not to Alexander Kozhev, the Soviet spy, but to Eric Vogelin, the Catholic professor of uh, philosophy, and Vogelin brings up this distinction between Caesarism and monarchy. And Strauss says, look, the classics, meaning by which he means Plato, Aristotle, Xenophon, Cicero, all the ancient political philosophers, they knew what the difference between Caesarism and monarchy was. And they deliberately ex uh, obscured the difference in their writing for a number of reasons, right? So first of all, what is the difference, right? Well, the main difference is that Caesarism, they're both one man rule. So monarchy, the very word itself means the rule of one, mono, one, arche rule, arche rule, the rule of one. Caesarism is the rule of one. What's the difference? Well, Caesarism is the rule of one after the decay of a Republican order, when it can no longer function as a Republican order and to restore order and to allow that measure of human flourishing that is still possible in a difficult circumstance. A, it, it could be anybody. We call it Caesarism because the the, the most prominent, notable person to embody this phenomenon was, of course, Julius Caesar, uh, appointed uh, dictator for life by the Romans. And if, I hope my numbers are correct. Some internet dork will correct me if I'm wrong. 49 BC <laughs> and assassinated in, 40, in 44 BC. Um, so it's named after Julius Caesar. Well, this is the product of a decayed Republican tradition that can't go on. Whereas monarchy, we know, or at least I'm just going to stick with the classics here from Aristotle, is the emergence of a, a higher form of government out of something lower 
through the crisis, right? So monarchy is one man rule, kind of out of chaos on an ascent. Caesarism is one man rule out of former order descending into chaos, into a descent. So they look on the surface the same, but they emerge out of different circumstances and they respond to different events and different exigencies. So in a way, Caesarism, it is a decline. Strauss himself, in a phrase that I enjoy from that book, likens it to deserved punishment. But Strauss doesn't say that it's it's bad or illegitimate in the circumstances in which it's deserved or which it's necessary. He just says that it's a, it's a decline from a better situation. It may be the best that you can do in a given circumstance. Uh, and that's not to say that it's great. It's not choice worthy for its own sake. It's not higher than other forms of government, but maybe it's the best that you can do in a certain circumstance. And so I think the reason why we're talking about it and why a lot of people are talking about it and we get accused when we talk about it. I know that I do. I know that Charles does. I know that all of you do is when, well, when you guys bring it up, you're wishing for it. You're longing for it. You love it. You want it. You're authoritarian. Actually, no, I will speak now only for myself. I actually, I don't want it. I lament it. It would be sad if we came to this pass, but the fact that we may come to this pass is sort of bigger than our wishes. So my wishes are for the regime of the founders. It's for 1787 forever. If we could maintain that, I would be the happiest person alive. I think that's the political um, sort of sweet spot golden age forever. But if we can't maintain it, and if we descend into something else, the political scientist in me, that is to say, just the pure analyst has to say, I, I try to understand phenomena as they are. And the fact of the matter is that even great regimes decay into something that we all don't like. And we have to deal with that. And so as a political scientist, I'm just looking at the trajectory of things and wondering where they might go and trying to um, keep alive two feelings, at, both separate and keep alive two feelings at the same time. One is the feeling of, I want the founder's regime to last forever. But the second is, I also have to see reality clearly and wonder about the trajectory that we're on and even worry about it when I think we're going in on a wrong path and on a downward path and be honest about that. And so that's why I talk about it and why I thought about it and why, you know, people, I think the people who get mad at me for talking about it either really don't understand what I've been trying to say, what we've all been trying to say, or they're just acting from bad faith and see an opportunity to attack and so attack out of willful ignorance. I, I think you'd be very hard pressed to find any Roman that lived from the rise of the Gracchus brothers to the rise of Caesar that would think things were not vastly improved after Augustus stabilized the situation. I mean, like, you're right to point out the distinction between monarchy and Caesarism. It's a huge distinction. Monarchy is something that grows out of the organic system of mutual obligations in, uh, as you say, like, like a primitive society, primitive relations in, in an honor culture. Um, and the monarchy is sort of an expression of that. If you look back at what happened in Rome after they conquered Carthage and took over the Mediterranean Empire, all the slaves float, flow back into the Roman, into the Italian heartland. These economies of scale, these massive slave-driven latifundia pop up and start driving all of the yeoman farmers who made up the citizenry of the Roman Republic into the cities to look, you know, to, to look for work and bread. And that citizenry that they had degraded over time into the Roman mob. Now, we don't have uh, slaves doing that today, but we had the Industrial Revolution that pushed all of those. I mean, if you look in uh, the Soviet Union in the 1930s, they were collectivizing all the farms, a.k.a. pushing all of these independent farmers into the cities to go do industrial work at the point of a gun or a threat of starvation. At the same time, the same process was taking place over in the United States. We weren't quite as direct about it during the Great Depression, but millions of farmers were having a sheriff show up with a gun and eviction papers saying, beat it. And they went into the cities to go look for work. And over time, what happened is those people who went into those cities to do that, all those organic social relations degrade. And eventually this society that was in form was in a state where, where, you know, the individual is plugged into a family, which is plugged into a community, which is plugged into a larger you know, regional social system with uh, uh, overlapping um, sources of authority and identity. And all of that builds up into a healthy state that all you have anymore is uh, 
an urban sort of abstract thinking uh, faceless mob that uh, is you know, that loses that form and then see and, and has no way to uh, express its political will against the money powers that dominate in a situation like that once everything has become urbanized in the surrounding countryside of every world city has been desiccated. And so what they do is just really like Caesar's a, um, a collective bargainer. Eventually, they just say, look, you know, we can't operate in the political institutions and compete with this, you know, the send the optimates or whatever. Uh, but what we can do is say, you, you're in charge, take care of this problem, act on our behalf, and we'll look away and won't much care how you do it. If I may, Matt, I know we should let Dave speak. Just a couple of thoughts here. One is, first of all, that the sheriff showing up on the farm, as soon as you said that, I thought of um, The Grapes of Wrath. You know, written by John Steinbeck, uh, bestseller of 1939, and made into a movie by uh, uh, an Academy Award winning movie by John Ford, uh, you know, the Claremont Institute's favorite director for, for many reasons, uh, starring Henry Fonda, which has that exact scene a guy who's worked the same farm for generations, being kicked off by the sheriff at the behest of a bank. It's one of the, it's the opening scene or one of the early scenes of the movie. Uh, very important, very powerful. And the second point is, of course, the real Caesar was um, his backbone, his base, if you will, was the urban mob, right? Caesar, the Caesarism is a, is a high-low coalition in a way. It's one alone mobilizing the mob against the, uh, the, the other powerful. Uh, it's, it's right out of, in a way, Machiavelli's Prince, Chapter 9, um, uh, which Machiavelli called Of the Civil Principle in which he describes, you know, one of the ways in which principality, by which principality is just Machiavelli's anodyne term for one man rule. And he doesn't care if you were born into it, if you took it by force, however you got it. Just monarchy is monarchy. In fact, he never uses the word tyrant in the whole book, famously. But one of the ways you become the civil principle is he says that the people feeling oppressed by the great will turn to someone and give him great reputation in order to defend them. And that is a great definition of Caesarism, when the people think that they have no outlet and they know they can't govern by themselves, and they know or feel that they're being oppressed. They will turn to someone to protect them. And I think this is what a lot of people today get so angry about. That is to say, what they call, oh, when they denounce populism, they're, they're angry at the people for turning to someone to protect them. And and they, they want to say, well, that this is an illegitimate, so which I say, well, maybe if you didn't constantly direct your politics around to spoiling the people day to day, they wouldn't feel that they needed to turn to one alone, as Machiavelli would say, uno solo, to protect them. And of course, that explanation uh, is never given any credence and no one says, hmm, no one gets introspective and rubs their chin and says, yes, maybe I have gone too far and I should back off. They just denounce you for it. Making the observation right. Well, well there's it, a I mean, distinction it, here, though, yeah. that that we should make between someone who is populist, reflecting the you know the let's say the popular will of the people, a tribune figure, and someone who actually can do the job, who has the power to to do that. Because as you know, we've we've seen in in many ways. I mean, not just Trump, who was elected sort of from this from this feeling from this temptation. If you don't give that guy power, it's probably worse at the end of the day. Um, you know, so so it's a it's a necessary the, the the ability to actually do the thing to stop the arrest of the downward spiral, or at least to uh, to shuffle the board in such a way that it's a, it's a different it's a it's a reset. I mean, we we um, I mean, I think that's the important thing at the end of the day. Can you say more about that? Because, um, you know, uh, as the, uh, as the originator, uh, uh, do you know what time it is? The objection is, um, well, if you say, do you know what time it is? It's because you guys all want an authoritarian fascist ruler. Um, and, um, I think that like teasing out a little bit, like why, if you like, what does it mean to know what time it is? That means we have to talk about Caesarism and you know, laying that out. Like, why is that the case? Because it's true. Like, I have no problem saying, looking at the camera and saying, yeah, it's time to talk about Caesarism because that's where we're at. I mean, that's, that's what, I mean, to me, it's a matter of analysis as Mike mm -hmm. was saying, this is not a, you just want to know what's going to happen. 
you you better be talking about this. Uh, but but I disagree. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, I disagree that Caesarism is uh, inevitable or even desirable. I right. don't think. You know, I, I I think it presupposes that we keep the country together, mm-hmm. and it presupposes that we that this that our Caesar rules over a bunch of people that you know I have no interest in ruling over, and vice versa. Right. So, I mean, I think at, at the end of the day, we will see, I mean, not just the United States, but a lot of other uh, political groupings, we will retreat into geographic areas where there is relative homogeneity in terms of uh, political outlook and just, just something manageable. The era of empire, these masses of lands with, with, um, with, uh, with many different you know, demographic and ideological groups and, and, and whatever. I mean, I, it's, it's, um, I, I think it's coming to a close, not just here, but, but elsewhere, uh, because different things are important. And anyway, I mean, it was, it was one of the things I would say it's, it's bound to fail. Um, the idea, the propositional America idea, America is an idea was bound to fail because an idea is not static. I'll, I'll take a counter to that okay. in a little bit. I don't disagree generally. I certainly agree that the country is likely to fragment, but I don't think that rules out the possibility of mini Caesars. That is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, mm-hmm. uh, since Caesar is an authoritarian reconstructor, not necessarily, and in fact, generally not a tyrant at all, the most efficient way of reconstructing a fragmented country into multiple smaller countries is through authoritarian rule, yes. perhaps la- then giving way to some other form of monarchy. I think the, the biggest kind of historical, and there's different examples other than Julius Caesar that you can give of Caesar types, whether that's Napoleon or Lenin or, or what have you. But I think the, the thing that's different for us um, and probably most different historically is that, and again, the original Julius Caesar is the best example of this. People were, found that necessary because they've been exposed to a hundred years of over warfare and you know, nothing makes people more unhappy than constant so, civil war. But we don't have that. What we have is something totally different. We have something that in some ways is worse, but it's not violent. We have the most insane regime ever in terms of its denial of reality, its you know, various forms of forced perversion, yeah. contamination, or what have you. It's not an exact analog, though, but it's not quite... It's easy for a military Caesar to arise. It's less obvious how a Caesar would arise in this circumstance. Well, wait, I, I would, I've been wanting to say this, and that oh. gives me the perfect opportunity. <laughs> that is to say, easy for a military Caesar to arise, I suppose, in theory, and yet the real Caesar was a military Caesar. Mm-hmm. He conquered Gaul. He had loyal legions. He famously crossed the Rubicon with the 13th Legion, as we know from his book on the Civil War. There isn't really anybody like that now that is to say, it's hard to imagine, you know, why would Mark Milley, just to pick a name out of the hat, become Caesar or rise up? I really wasn't anticipating or, that one. Or, 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 or rise up <laughs> against a regime of which he is an integral part. Lo- he's loyal to it. It is loyal to him. He will retire from the military whenever. That won't be long from now, a few years from now. He will be showered with honors and, and given all kinds of corporate boards and, 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 and retain a place. So you have to look outside of that. You have to look at some kind of dissident. And there are dissidents to this regime. To be sure, there may be dissidents who wish to be Caesar. But I don't see any of them who have that kind of loyalty of sufficient numbers and power within the security state who can replicate Caesarism along the original model. So, so let me let me pile on to that a little bit just real quick, uh, because I'm going to represent what I think a lot of uh, you know the audience is thinking. Which is, which is, again, but why is this good for me, actually? Uh, and so, like, like, where is the military example? And also, okay, reconstruct, but, but how do I know this guy's on my side at all? I mean, and we don't even know where he comes from. He's not military, in our example. You said that's the well, anomaly. The answer to the conundrum, I think, is, is as military versus non-military relates to what Dave said earlier, which is that it nece- necessarily, whether we like it or not, fragmentation implies some degree of conflict. And so within that frame, it certainly will people will arise as relevant, th- whose names we don't know now. I mean, that's just the way these thing- things work. And as to what it'll, it could potentially do for people, obviously it could be very bad for people. You can have a Caesar who is a tyrant, who is extractive. You're, 
But most of those things come from the movies because, as you know, my, one of my favorite phrases comes from Jose Ortega y Gasset, force follows public opinion. So any Caesar has to have a significant amount of, and this kind of goes to Daryl's point earlier, that you know, the, the downtrodden have to support the Caesar. Not 100%, obviously, but you can't have top-down, forced, totalitarian leadership of this type. And so if you're tired of your children being groomed, you know, Caesar in this scenario isn't going to do that. Caesar will probably cut your taxes because he doesn't have to have, he can, he, he can get rid of much of the bureaucracy. He, he'll, of course, keep a significant amount of taxes so that he can live the lifestyle and have the security apparatus that he desires to keep his his position because he's not stupid and he knows that people want to take his position. But your average person relative to the average deplorable in America today could at least anticipate the possibility of a Caesar or a micro Caesar or a mini Caesar or whatever the phrase is, improving that person's situation. And that's what matters to start with, which is that people will support this kind of thing if they think they can thereby improve their situation. Yeah, Caesar's not on your side. Caesar's on Caesar's side. Mm -hmm. And your relationship with him is transactional, right? So like Charles said, Caesar's not going to let uh, let the teachers in the public schools groom your kids because it's not in, in his interest to do that. It destabilizes his, his rule. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where his interest lies. So, yeah, I don't think it's really a matter of him being on your side or not. Okay. Okay. So that's a good uh, segue into what I really want to get into because I think the, the, the person who made up Red Caesar and Blue Caesar is in the room uh and so. it would be something that more people uh should have read uh and should know about but it'd be it'd be useful if given that is i think the definition of caesar in everyone's head you know at the at the in these chairs he's on his own side but there could be a red caesar or a blue caesar according to you according i mean i i posited as I posited it as possibility. So in my book, The Best Stakes, Still for Sale, Please Buy, etc. Uh, it's a great book. Um, in chapter seven, I sketch out possibilities on the, not assumption, but on the possibility that the, what I consider to be an unsustainable path that the United States is on now continues. Where does this lead? And one possibility is, is that the current regime can just go on for decades or centuries. I don't believe that. But you have to admit it as a possibility because none of us really knows. And so if you then say, well, what if it doesn't go on? You have to ask, well, what might come next? And I sketch a bunch of possibilities. And two of them were Red Caesar and Blue Caesar. And, you know, both of these have been criticized from different directions. So I think I've sort of already stated the criticism of Red Caesar. And they mostly come from people who, if I may say, would like a red Caesar, they say, well, I hate the current regime. I'd much rather have a red Caesar. And then they lay out reasons why they don't think it would happen. And they basically say what I already said, that the real Caesar, when, when this happens, it's usually somebody from within the security state who has a huge cadre of people loyal within mm -hmm. the security state. That, obviously, that means the military. But in our context, it also means the intelligence community, law enforcement, and so on. They said, They say, I don't see anybody in America like that who has the following that Julius Caesar had with the legions uh, when he had it, or even that Franco had, let's say in 1936. So that seems impossible. And then as for blue Caesar, it's like, well, why would you even, so I, I actually raised all of these objections in my own book. You know, if you're the left, why let it devolve into one, I was gonna say man, but of course that's ridiculous. I mean, why? one person rule or I mean, why blue people, Caesar is definitely whoever the hell not going to be a, a man. The left already has distributed control over yeah. the country. And as soon as they try to formalize, if they were to try to formalize uh, all power into the hands of Uno Solo, one alone, then they all get to fight over who it is. And they don't just get to fight over which individual it is, but which Democrat demographic category gets to hold it here and there. And that fractures the coalition. So probably if they're smart enough, and they seem to have been so far as dumb as they are, they realize now it's better to just leave the distributive model, control all the institutions, and not formalize somebody as the monarch. So in a, in a way, maybe my own two categories are both wrong. There won't be a red Caesar or a blue Caesar. I don't know. Well, I'm going <clears> to <throat> throw out there that uh, Gavin Newsom strikes me as a guy who uh, 
He may want it. it. Could be blue season. Oh, but the because, question, yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't de- deny that a guy like, like Gavin to, Newsom. To, to me, for the left, though, just let me, let me pause it. Like uh, to me, for the left, blue season would be someone who um, outwardly proclaims legitimacy of his Caesardom uh, and just takes the mantle, right? So, th- in other words, you Biden's already doing this. I mean, the other side is is illegitimate. I therefore have extra powers that I should have. And he's doing it in a half-assed dementia kind of way right. where I could see Gavin coming in and going, look, you're all r- retarded. Like, all of you Democrats suck. And you, you don't have any leader. Like, Kamala can't speak English. Like, you, 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 I'm coming in and I will fight for you. And by the way, I will, I will uh, take these powers like FDR, you know, our Stalin, our, our Hitler, uh, like FDR. I will take them uh, because I can. And he would, le- he would like, legitimize... Uh, it almost wouldn't be a, it's less of a Rubicon. Whereas right. if a right Caesar comes along, we know what would happen because yes, you because can't it, even Because pro- it would be a much more obvious regime change. Yeah. If a red Caesar were to come along, he would be saying, I reject the woke, you know, basically the woke left corporo state governance model that's been in place in the United States for or whatever you want to, however far you want to backdate it. We can debate right. that. Right. What I would say is, we can keep the nomenclature of Caesarism. We all like it because we're all classical geeks here. But if you want to point to the examples uh, in the 20th century that are most relevant or that seem to be most reflective of this idea, it seems to me I pick three off the top of my head, two of which are rightist and one of which is leftist. Um, Franco in Spain, Salazar in Portugal, that's the leftist, and uh, Pinochet in Chile, another rightist. Right. And so you say, well, so Newsom may want to be Blue Caesar, but the problem I think that he would have is uh, everyone, if, if a red Caesar, despite the fact that, as I say, I agree with those critics, or at least I, I think they make a point when they say, you know, a red Caesar in the United States, what legions is he going to bring? Who's going to follow him? Okay. A blue Caesar would have that, but the blue, the red Caesar would have that dynamic from Prince Nine that I already talked about. Whereas everybody who feels put upon and oppressed by this regime would line up behind him, and there wouldn't be a lot of opposition. Whereas a blue Caesar who tries to, Gavin tries to say, you know, the real definition of Caesarism is your president for life or until you voluntarily resign, right? If Gavin tried to do that, it seems to me the blue coalition is so fragile that they would all be like. How do I get rid of that guy? Because yeah. the the white male hair, you know, yeah. hair gel dude, yeah. he can't be president for life, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Kamala is not going to accept that with mm-hmm. good grace, nor will all kinds of others who will say, why is it my demographic in here? Why does it have to be a guy? Why does it have to be a white guy? Why does it have to be a cis white guy? Why does it have to be this? Why does it have to be that? What about my people and my demographic and this? And they're going to go at one another. This is why, to the extent that they are wise, which maybe the Democrats, sorry, the Blue Coalition is wiser than we think, they realize it's better to just sort of paper all this over and keep going with the distributive model for as long as possible. Yeah, so basically what we're saying, I think, just real quick, is that Gavin would probably get eight years as Blue Caesar as normal. If he wanted to do the abnormal thing and become Caesar Caesar, he'd have to cut his genitals off. Uh, I mean, he'd have to change his identity in some way. He'd have to sacrifice onto the gods uh, because because their coalition would be ravenous, which makes uh, a bit of sense. Um, is a red Caesar even possible through democratic means in the United States? Oh. No, no way. But, but Caesarism is not. I mean, what what does that mean through democratic means? What's the real or, Caesar? Well, no, no. But like you know, guy gets red guy gets elected, which you know. I mean, I, I have my doubts about you know about that how that would go, and then sort of becomes Caesar, because that would solve the problem of yeah, well, a guy that you know a, a a guy who nobody's ever heard of. But I mean, the system would revolt against him. I think it, 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 something like that would be DOA. Caesar had to fight a war too. I, I think go back to the summer of 2020. Cities are burning. Mm-hmm. You've got media corporations celebrating, pushing it, um, arguably orchestrating through propaganda attacks on American cities. Um, I think you would be very, or maybe you wouldn't, maybe none of us would, but I think a lot of people would be surprised if you were to say, well, if Trump were to order the military in against the wishes of those cities and states, 
and shut that down. And when CNN started criticizing him for it, he sent the Marines in and had them arrested. And when Millie says, well, we're not doing any of that, he's fired and arrested and just went down the line. How many people would support that? I think you'd be surprised. I'd I think you'd be surprised. I'd support, I'd support, I'd support it too. So let me, let me, like, let me drill in on that because it is true that, of, um, look, I mean, in, in many ways, you in the last few years publicly have been sort of a tribune of the people yourself uh, describing what normal people were thinking, et cetera. And I guess one of my objections throughout this entire conversation is to constantly bring up among those who are very online, you know, maybe too online. Um, a lot of regular people though are still, they're not like when you say Caesarism, it's terrible. It's terrible. Like a pr- terrible presentation. It's terrible rhetoric. So a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm an American. I, I don't want, you know, Caesarism. That, that sounds terrible. Yeah. That sounds fascist, blah, blah, blah. Well, Caesarism but, is always yeah. disguised, right? Caesar so, said he was coming in to restore the Republic. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, what, I, what I'm session. saying is, what I'm saying is, let's yeah. drill into how you think, um, you know, regular people would understand, yes, this is the way to go. It needs to happen. I think you're tapping into something there. But also, when people will talk in high fluting terms about this stuff, it turns a lot of good people off, I have to say, like who aren't on the left, who you know totally don't care about that stuff. They're not afraid. They're like, I don't understand. Like, what do you mean? And yeah. and I, I but, but on the other hand, when you just explain the kind of practical things you're talking about, I think you're right. Yeah, any potential Caesar who uh, mentions Caesar in the same sentence as his own name would <laughs> not be come Caesar. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think uh, in many ways, though, there is a crown sitting in the gutter that's waiting to be picked up by somebody who uh, is, is willing and able to act decisively. Um, you know, I, I have a couple friends I hadn't seen in probably 10 years. I was really good friends with them. Guy was in a band, girl was a photographer and artist, totally apolitical people, you know, um, and you just your general, you would, you would meet them and think, oh, these are generally apolitical, tolerant liberals, right? right. And it was like 10 years since I'd met them. And they had two little girls at the time, babies. And I saw them again for the first time just uh, last year, and they couldn't get 10 minutes into our meeting without telling us how they've pulled their kids out of school, they're homeschooling them because everything is going. And I thought to myself, if they've radical, and then they had, if they've radicalized these people, yeah. of all people, there are a hell of a lot of people out there who, um, you know, I mean, because they were at a loss. I mean, they, they people in, in, in their situation with kids who, they're, they're, they're are coming home, uh, telling them what their what their teacher told them. Um, those people are, are that's real desperation. Yeah. I mean, when, when things like that are on the line and, you know, democracies, uh, I, I, they, they tend to die from exhaustion, I think, you know, where people welcome, call it tyranny or Caesarism if you want to. But they welcome it because they just you just get tired of politics. People on the right, especially, you know, leftism and fanaticism kind of go hand in hand. Like they're kind of just two sides, you know, two sides of the same coin. People on the right, your average person on the right is not a fanatic. They don't want to be a fanatic. They don't really want to be involved with politics that much, except maybe on the PTA level or, right. or something like that. And so when somebody comes along and says, give me the power to act on your behalf and you can do that, you can go grill, you can go to the PTA meeting and not have to worry about mm-hmm. any of this stuff. It's very appealing. It's very, very appealing. Yeah. And well, again, um, to your point, it's transactional. It's also in Caesar's interest. Caesar wants to depoliticize everything because what's in his interest for people to to comment on what he's doing? Yeah. He does his thing, you do your thing, everybody's happy. Like if you were to if you were to put a silent ballot vote out there um asking people, you know, you don't get to vote anymore, or maybe you get to vote on you know, local ordinances and which roads, potholes get filled or whatever. Mm-hmm. But all the federal stuff, all, that's all done. You're not a part of that anymore. But all this racial stuff that's mm-hmm. gone, mm-hmm. all this, uh, you know, sexual revolution stuff, you're always worried and argue. That's get rid all, of all the craziness. Yeah. TikTok. I don't know. I don't know if you would get uh, 51%, but Caesar doesn't need 51% because mm-hmm. most people, they just go along to get along. If you've mm-hmm. got a hardcore 30%, then you can go a long way. I think to, to Mike's point earlier, it's it's important. The distributed model that the left offers is less powerful in a conflict. Like it's, ne- it's necessarily true that you have to satisfy all of these different entities or, or interest groups 
And since the nature of the left is to exalt emancipation, people don't want to, would have very great difficulty submitting their desires and interests to a blue Caesar, even for pure efficiency purposes in some kind of conflict. Whereas people who might other, might support a red Caesar would find that quite easy. And so in some kind of conflict situation, efficiency through one man rule is always going to be the distributed model. Oh, I think we should move to the disavowal part of the conversation. Um, Why? Okay, so I think we need to uh, to wrap this up. Uh, many of us have uh, important things to do, like drink more adult beverages and talk to people. Maybe we'll conscript, conscript some people to come in uh, as if we were Caesar and talk to them at length. Against uh, this their time will. Meeting. <laughs> Against their will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So speaking of which, I think we should go around and just, if anyone wants to disavow anything, you know, if it's on your heart, as the Protestant brothers say, or if you feel as if, as if in this conversation, you need to disavow things that may be taken out of context, it's time to do that. Right now, starting with Dave Boy. Oh boy, shit. Um, I, I can't think of anything I would like do to Do people disavow. misunderstand anything about you and national divorce and Caesar? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a trick. It's a it's it's a tricky one. The mo- most of the objections that I get are of two different types. When I talk about national divorce, I talk about national divorce such that people should prepare themselves for something, and I spend a lot of time talking about the reasons for 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 why we no longer understand each other, why we hate each other, blah, 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 and why I think at the end of the day the, the basis is our conception of justice is too different. Um, but anyway, so the two objections that I get is number one is, let's say, from the right. I get from, from let's say, the hyper-online right. Mm-hmm. They will come and they will say, no, we want America full stop. We're going to, you know, we need to exert power. I had one say, like, Oh, you know, you, you you worked for Victor Orban. Just you know, just do what you need to do. Take uh, you know, to take control of, of the levers of, of government power and just do based things. Problem solved. I'm like, I, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> um, that's just you know. <laughs> why didn't you just do what based? Else? I know. How did I, how did I miss it? Right. Um, so I mean, I don't think that's a, that's particularly serious, um, considering the the. You know, considering what time it is, um, I don't think we're we're at at the point where um, something like that is possible. The other objection, which I feel like I'm constantly trying, maybe in a s- small, tiny way, is to destroy this idea of what I call brain dead boomer con nonsense, which is this like we need to start approaching the idea in our minds. Maybe not we, you know we sitting here but like we as folks on the right people who usually vote Republican conservatives blah 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 have to come to grips with the idea that this this regime we are living under is not the rah rah America that we maybe grew up believing in it's no longer that country and there are a lot of different things that necessarily flow from that realization Okay, we can talk about those later. But first, people, I really believe that people need to wake up and, and, and say, no, this is not, I mean, look, it, you talked about the gender, the, the you know, some of the gender stuff. I think that's such a core civilizational issue. And it's such an absurd fault line. Like, how did we get here when the state is, 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 is you know, doing, it is it's really doing stuff like this um, you know under penalties of, of you know pulling funding and now they want I don't know if you've heard the latest thing now they want uh, you know to to to, uh, to somehow you know send the FBI after reporters who are who are writing disinformation about trans blah 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 gender blah 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 right. and, and all this stuff I don't know I think that there is a fun, you know, I may have to disavow this later, but I think that there's some kind of fundamental split between the before times and now. I didn't think it was possible for parents themselves 
to take their own children and say, you know what, I'm going to push someone to destroy their lives like this with, with, with gender stuff. I thought like, you know what, I can sort of understand if someone says somebody else's kid, mm -hmm. but like your kid, right. that's like that's like playing with the fabric of someone's humanity. That's like there's something really, really wrong. So blah, 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 all that said, um, I disavow nothing. Um, and uh, that's, that's where it is. Disavow nothing, I like it. I mean, it's a trick question because we all know you disavow nothing and apologize for nothing. And whoever's out there in the ether is not a priest or confessor, so F off. Uh, at the same time, uh, Daryl Cooper, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have, like many of us, you face criticism from multiple sides uh, in the very online world we live in. And you were just in a conversation that, uh, you know, impugns your, <laughs> your beliefs as radical, uh, potentially uh, pro-Caesar, pr possibly prudentially. Um, what do you kind of say to that? Well... I gave the impression, I might have given the impression earlier, that I thought it would be a good thing to have the employees of the major news corporations in Congress and much of the bureaucracy rounded up and shot. And I don't disavow that at all, and I want <laughs> everybody to know that. There you go. You see, when we do interviews on this show, we do interviews, for real. Let's go to Michael Anton and then to Charles Haywood. Um, disavowal. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I know few people who have had so much criticism from all sides for leading forward uh, as as you, uh, and you have to deal with it. It's part of the deal, right? Um, so, what what in terms of like nuancing? This disavowal may be too strong a word. Like, what do you want to say to these people? I don't know. I, I guess. I wasn't planning to say this, but I will say it. The, I, I rarely feel bad about it. The one time I felt a little bad is um, when the there was an article, and you'll remember it, that came out in the, it was actually a good article, right? That came out in the New York Times Magazine about the Claremont Institute. And we all talked to them, and it, it, was, it was actually, not to say favorable, but fair, balanced. Nobody was unhappy about it. And my mother, who, despite, she says, the New York Times has become really anti-American. And my mother's a Northern California Democrat. Uh, you know, and she read the article, and I said, I don't know. she mentioned it, and I said, no, we weren't that unhappy about it. I thought it was okay. And she was unhappy. She says, it just, it, just, it just makes me sad to think that you're just, all, you're just always going to be attacked from now on. And I said, you know, I, Mom, I kind of knew what I was doing, and I, that's the way it goes. Most of the people who are attacking me, I really don't take that seriously, and I'm not that concerned about it. But I felt bad that she felt bad, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like, she kind of wanted yeah, yeah. to just have life go on the way she had gone on. Yeah. And she was an elected official, and her father was an elected official. And so these are people that had been used to taking stands mm -hmm. and, you know, having people vote against them and being attacked. And still, even having gone through all of that, she thought that I was some kind of outlier, which I suppose I am from her perspective, and it made her sad. And, you know, I don't disavow, I, I don't regret anything. I mean, well, I, I don't regret choices that I made. I regret some of the consequences, you know, and I've written about this and I get attacked for, I get attacked for a lot of things. but. You know, I'm actually somewhat sad about friends that I've lost over sure. the course of this. In fact, I'm, I'm mostly sad about people who I know basically agree with me because they've said so, or the disagreements are about things that are, not, not to say marginal, but they're reasonable disagreements. It's like, I can hear them go, well, you're wrong about this, and I go, yeah, I can see it that way, but my point of view is this, I can also see your point of view. And they can't go, yeah, well, I guess that's true, but we've been friends for 30 years, so let's just keep talking they ghost you and walk away. And that's been happening more and more. It's actually happened more in the last couple of years than it happened in 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's not, that's a regret in a way. It's not a regret in the sense that, well, if I had it to do over again, I never would have written this, or I never would have said that, or I never would have worked there. But I look back and I go, do I wish life had to turn out this way? You know, no, I'd still do it because yeah. you got to, you know, they all think that they're standing on principle, following their beliefs. So, I am too. I'm not the one who, you know, Truth goes first. to you and walked away from you. And that, 
you know, I, and, I, and I really do, I want to say this, and then I'm, I'll get attacked for this, but I especially want to say this. I really do hope somebody sees this and go, oh, look at the whiny little bitch complaining that people won't talk to him anymore. Oh, you know, you wrote the Flight 93 election and now your feelings are hurt. Like, yeah, I, I want that kind of attack. That's good. I think that's yeah. clarifying because I, yeah, I've taken some tough stands and I've been critical, but I've always tried to remain friendly with people with whom I've been friends forever and keep the lines of dialogue open. And they're the ones that have slammed the door and have been vicious. Actually, I prefer the slammed door because at least that sends a message. The people that have just stopped talking altogether without explanation, mm -hmm. won't return a call, won't pick up the phone, won't return a text, won't return an email, just pretend like they never heard of you. I never did that to them, even though I think some of their stances were unbelievably stupid. And so if you're watching this and taking delight in the fact that I'm telling you, yeah, that was kind of painful, I think that says a lot about your soul. And so reflect on that. Think about it when you lay awake at night, if you ever do. Spiritual advice right here. Charles Haywood, disavows nuances, anything? Well, I certainly disavow nothing. And I wholeheartedly endorse everything else said here. I endorse what Dave says about national divorce. I definitely endorse what Daryl says about <laughs> dealing with certain regime you know, supporters and allies and elements. And I agree with everything Mike says, certainly. Uh, I've never disagreed with anything Mike says, uh, nor have I attacked him. Though I have to admit, I have never lost any friends. As far as I know, maybe that's because I never had any friends, but as far as I've been fortunate in that I, I have not, not experienced some of these these personal things. But, but I, want, I want to avow is that I'm an optimist, right? I think that despite the fact that it's going to be painful and there's going to be a period of time when there will be a lot of difficulties, you know, Toynbee's time of troubles, I think that in the lands that once were America, there is still a tremendous amount of virtue mm. and elements of good, and maybe it'll be multiple countries, and yes, we have to get rid of the 5% or so execration uh, of people who are you know, uh, directing a lot of the horrors on our society by moving them to Canada, uh, or maybe to Toronto while we take the rest of Canada or something like that. But I am very optimistic. And I understand that kind of fits to your point about like what do people think listening to these things. It kind of fits incongruously. Right? Like, well, we're going to have all these big changes. So we're going to have authoritarianism or potentially authoritarianism. But I think through that path, not necessarily only that path, but that's a potential path to getting to renewing society, not unfortunately by returning it to the founding, which would be desirable, but I don't think it's possible, but to kind of have a rebirth of virtue. I think that's possible. And I, I believe that very strongly. I don't think that we're, we're consigned to some decayed civilization where nothing ever good happens again. Can I say just one yeah. last little thing, picking up on where I left off. Um, Look, I, I admit, as I said, um, I am sad about a lot of the things that happened. I will say, on the upside, is I think I have gained more friends from the path that I took than I have lost. My universe has actually, in a way, been enlarged. And enlarged is not a word, I guess. Enlarged. Uh, embiggened, to quote Jebediah <laughs> Springfield. Um, uh, you know, I, there are a lot. I'm in, you know, more in circulation. I'm in contact with more people. It's a great life in so many ways. And so I, you know, as a, if we're just going to talk about it in terms of net net, remember that line from Mitt Romney? Mm -hmm. in, uh, I was going to say 1912, but that's probably wrong, right? It was 2012. Uh, it, feels you know, like it, 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 it all turned out better. I'm still sad about that, though. And I know that there are some people out there who will see this and will be like, I'm glad that you're sad. And I just want to say to those of you who think that, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I, uh... <clears throat> I, I love uh, I love what you just did uh, in both you know what you said before and right here. Um, I think it's important that people realize that, you know the the cost is real, uh, the people are real, and a lot of times when you're you know listening or in the audience or whatever you're looking for a kind of you know intellectual avatar. I mean it's just normal, it's natural. You're looking for an intellectual avatar who like represents this or that. And uh, the important thing to realize, if you're going to grow in your own self and you're going to gain anything by listening to these kinds of conversations, if you're that kind of strange person who's probably on the list with us because you're listening, if you're if you're doing that, uh, you know you need to realize this is real. These are real people. This is a real this is a real uh, a battle. And uh, it, to to admit the humanness of the situation where 
uh, yeah, there's cost. There's cost in friendship. There's cost in, uh, you know, it does hurt when, when you see these things happen. But also, there's a certain sense of we're beyond it, right? I mean, it's like the bridges are burned. And what has happened is a, a movement that is more than political uh, in the sense that people usually talk about that word. I understand that word. Uh, uh, it's commercial. It's cultural. It's deeper than uh, what anyone is talking about or realizes. Uh, so I, I, I disavow nothing um, for this evening at all. Uh, I am uh, just happy to be here with, with men like this who are thinking and doing the things that are needed. Um, I hope you tune in next time for the next episode, which will be called Fake or Performative. Uh, and it's going to be a great episode. Um, I, I hope to see you very soon. That's a wrap. Uh, I tried to go as far as I could in showing you um, unredacted footage of, uh, of all of us in the wild. And I hope that if you like it, let me know at DOCMJP, uh, DocMJP at Twitter. Uh, like, rate, and review this podcast if you like this. Uh, please, it does help, they tell me. I know it's a pain in the ass. I hate it when people ask this because they all say the same thing, right? Every podcast, like, review, rate, smash that like button. And I want to punch them in the face. But uh, it does help, they tell me, they swear. So all I want you to do is if you haven't done it yet, if you have, God bless you, go about your business. If you haven't, it only takes a second. Just, you know, don't be uh, don't be ridiculous. Just go and give us that, that, uh, that rating on uh, Apple, Spotify, whatever. I really appreciate it. If you like this show, you owe it to me. You got it for free. Uh, speaking of uh, free and not free and so forth, uh, New Founding is a for-profit company that is doing very interesting things uh, to move the ball forward and uh, really promote an American way of life and a commercial cultural movement moving in the opposite direction of ESG, social justice, and the wokeness. It's not a grift. Uh, it's a full of talented people doing some amazing things. Go to newfounding.com to learn more about us. Go to newfounding.com to support. Uh, become a member. Support this uh, show. We could do so much more. Uh, we could have you know professional people making the kinds of uh, the kinds of stuff you just saw on a professional level all the time, talking about interesting things. And that's what we need to do. That's what I want to do. I would love to do that. But we have to build the media structure in order to do it. Anyway, newfounding.com. Go and become a member there. That would be great. And finally, before I leave you, I have to remind you that if you are an aspiring Caesar, uh, and uh, or maybe you just want to find an aspiring Caesar you know, in your life, uh, you should lay off uh, a lot of the, the crazy caffeine, sugar drinks, the milkshakes you get at Starbucks. You should lay off the, you know, high caffeine, caffeine alcohol, you know, cycle that everyone's on, it's terrible. And the way to do that, the way to stop, calm yourself, find that peace and joy I'm talking about, and center yourself, one of the ways to do that is with Gold River Tea. <laughs> this is an advertisement, fool you, except not, because you know damn well what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the tea is better for you. You've experienced this already. If you're like me, you just forget, you just go back to the coffee. I don't have to forget because Gold River, uh, Gold River Trading Company, Gold River Tea, GoldRiverCo.com. This is one of the new foundings companies, uh, and, uh, and and it's good stuff. It's like high quality tea, and it's uh, you know it's it's all about everything new founding is about. And I'll just leave it at that. But if you go to GoldRiver.co, uh, go, I'm sorry, GoldRiverCo.com, uh, you can save 10% off all orders by putting new founding in there at checkout. Uh, and uh, you get a discount, you get to try some tea. I highly encourage it. Why not? Help support us, help support the movement. That's all I got for you today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Let us know. And I hope we can do a lot more like this in the future. Stay alive. Stay limber. We need to do that.